One of the biggest points um, that I have in this area relates to the fact that um, how the site looks, the appearance of the, of the site, is really only one aspect of web design. Um, and there are a lot of other aspects of web design that are as important, at least as important. Um, that's one thing I like to emphasize, because if you look at books or websites about web design, a lot of times they will focus on strictly the appearance. And, and that is an important part. You know, uh, it, It's good if your website looks good. It speaks well for your organization. You can make your site sort of match sort of what your corporate image is and, and so on. But it goes beyond simply the way it looks. And it gets into making sure you're solving the, the needs of the users by going to the site. And therefore, the, the methodology we're going to do in this class is we're first going to d define what our project's about in, in very broad terms. And we're going to narrow it down by defining who our typical users are. And those are things are called personas. And we're talking about what the goals of uh, those users are. Um, and what the goals of the organization is for creating the site. You need to know those goals and you need to know who those people are before you do anything else on the site. Because everything that you do from here on in on the design and the creation of the site is going to be filtered through those things. Filtered through the kind of people that are going to be viewing the site and what their goals are. All right. Um, so you want to make your site look good. Well, look good to who? Look good to your typical user. And again, we had the example last time of Barbie versus um, ACDC, the sites. Both their sites could look good, um, even though they looked wildly different. And the reason for that is they're going after a different target audience. So of course they're going to look different. They have, both of those organizations have, a, have an image to portray. And they're, 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 the, the visitors of the site are going to expect that image. And if they don't get it, it's not going to seem right to them. So, we talked about the first two sections of our design document. We talked about the strategy and the scope. The strategy being where we define the goals. Uh, we define, again, in basic terms what the site's about, in broad terms, and we refine it by talking about our three user personas and their goals, and then we talk about the goals of the organization. And then the scope is where we talk about specific pieces of content that help to satisfy those goals. Um, I would like to spend a minute reviewing it, then I'd like to do just a brief little exercise to talk about a, a website and get your opinion whether you think it's a well-designed site or not. And I'll tell you, I'm very flexible. You can convince me either way of the site that we're going to look at. So don't think like I have a correct answer in my mind And, uh, and, and at any rate. A couple things about goals. First of all, goals are not things like my site is going to have a good navigation. All right? That's not a goal for your site. No matter how good your navigation is, people aren't visiting your site to admire how good your navigation is. People are visiting your site to get to some specific piece of content, to get to, uh, to, to accomplish a task, um, to find a bit of information. So no one goes to a site simply to enjoy the navigation of the site. All right. So it might be to find information. When is the library? When is LC's library hours? That's a piece of information. Um, what is um, you know um, what um, you know? I want to register for classes. That's a process that you want to go through. I want to find what classes are available. That's a process that you go through. All those things are reasons why people visit the site. And therefore, those could be considered goals. So goals are not something that just relates to good web design, like my site will be attractive. That's not a goal, because people aren't visiting your site specifically for that. It's a goal to say, this is why, this is what someone hopes to accomplish by visiting your site. Uh, the band example that we talked about last time. Maybe, the, uh, maybe one of the goals for a new listener to a band will be to decide if they like the band or not. That's my goal. I'm going to visit the site to find out if I should go see them next week when they're in town. All right? 
that's the goal that they have. That's what they're trying to decide. All right? Not things like good, simple, good navigation, or it should look attractive, or be user friendly, or whatever. All right? So the goal should relate specifically to why people are coming to the site. The second thing is, is there, again, there's a relationship between the goals and the requirements. Any goal could be solved by many requirements, right? And every requirement could relate to several goals. Um, and there could be possible alternatives to what content you put on your site to satisfy a goal. For example, if the goal of a user is to decide whether they should go see this band perform, am I going to like this band? That's a goal. That's why they visit the site. There's a lot of things that you could do to help convince them. You could put audio clips on. You could put maybe a complete song that they could download and listen to. You could put videos on the site. You could put reviews. All right, maybe what the, what the newspaper had to say ab about the band or whatever, or if they were uh, in, you know, reviewed in a magazine or something like that. All those things are things that could potentially help the user satisfy their goal of deciding if this is a band that they want to see or not. Are you going to do all of them? Probably not. You're going to decide which ones do you think are going to be most effective for your target audience. All right? You don't want to, you, you know, you don't want to uh, throw everything in but the kitchen sink. You know, you don't want overkill. You, uh, that, that's part of the design process is going through and deciding which pieces of content are going to most effectively satisfy the goal of the users and the goals of the organizations creating the site. And again, like I said before, every goal should have one piece of content at least or one requirement that um, supports that goal. And every requirement should correspond to a goal. All right. If you've defined something as one well, of the most important reasons people are coming to your site and you don't have any content that supports that, then that's a waste. By the same token, if you have something that doesn't relate to any of your goals, you might question why do you need it on your site and get rid of it because it just adds clutter to your site. All right, here's a site I would like to, to view. Um, and it's a site maybe some of you are familiar with, maybe some of you are not. I'll bet probably most of you have heard it. Uh, Craigslist. Let's look at Craigslist and decide if we think it's a well-designed site or not. For those of you that haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Any thoughts about this? What's your initial reaction when you look at this? First of all, does anyone know what the, can, can we review what the purpose of Craigslist is? What, what is Craigslist? What is, is it a site for? Classified ads. Yeah, it's essentially online classified ads. So if you, wanna, if you need to rent an apartment, if you want to buy a, uh, a used car, if you want to uh, just about anything, um, you, can, you can look up and find um, on Craigslist. So it's, it's, it would serve the purpose of like the classified ads used to do a long time ago in the, in the newspaper. Any thoughts on the design of this? Yes? Cluttered. It's cluttered. All right. That's true. On the other hand, well, I won't say on the other hand. We'll, we'll make some observations uh, in a minute. Anyone else have any feedback on this?
Plain, not fancy. Right. Yeah, this, this is very, very, very bare bones. I mean, it's about, um, you know, it's about as simple as, as you can make it in terms of um, being plain. All right. Now let's look at those two things. Because, first of all, cluttered. Normally we talk about cluttered as being a bad thing. All right. Now, let's, it, there is a lot of information on here. That's true. But, notice one thing. It's categorized fairly well. Community, housing, jobs, for sale, services, gigs, discussion forums. All right? And over here you have other areas. And then you have some stuff over here. So although there is a lot of information, I would say that information is fairly well organized. All right? In that, it's pretty easy, at a glance, to find what you're looking for. And while it's plain, the elements of style they do use are useful in visually organizing it. So for example, community is blue with a gray background and a little bit bigger font. So you could easily see that this is a grouping, this is a grouping, this is a grouping, this is a grouping. Um, I've heard it said that, that one way that you can, you can sort of look at the design of a web page is if you have glasses, take your glasses off. All right? If you don't have glasses, kind of squint, you know, unfocus your eyes, you know, try to focus like at a different. And I take my glasses off. And I can't really see that there's a monitor there. No, just kidding. Uh, I take my glasses off, and I can see, even though I can't literally read a word, I can get a sense of how it's organized just by the basis of these gray bars and the blue things are links. And I can know that, and I can get that feel instantly. So if I wanted to criticize this site, I would say it's cluttered. If I wanted to praise this site, I would say there is a lot of information, but it does seem to be well organized. All right? The simplicity of it. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward and it's pretty boring. However, are you coming to this site to be entertained? Are you coming to the site to see dazzling animations or see images on this page. No, there are images on this site when you get into looking at the individual products for sale. All right, so there are images on this site where they're useful, right? Can you really think of an image that could appear on this page that would add to the page? What image could they put, could you put on this page that would add to the page? That would make it more useful to its users? I can't really think of any, all right? Maybe like a Craigslist logo, but even that. It's clear that this is Craigslist. All right, now, the one thing I would say, though, is to really assess how beneficial this is, how good this site is, how well it's designed, we should come to this site with a goal in mind and see if we can easily satisfy our goal, all right? People would come to Craigslist, two different personas that uh, would come to this Craigslist uh, site would be, number one, people that have something to sell, number two, people that have something they want to buy. Let's just consider buyers in our example, because I don't want to actually go and add a product to sell. You know, um, I'm, you know I, I could just see entering test data in just to show you and have someone come in here showing up trying to buy my laptop off me or something like that. We don't want that to happen. So let's imagine I want to buy something. What should I try to buy? Upright An upright base. Wow, that's a good one. All right. So how would we go about finding that? Well, I would say there's two ways that we could do this. First of all, for sale, musical instruments. And then, we can scroll through here. Oh my goodness, looky here. All right, 
that's all I had for you for today. Uh, I hope you have a good uh, couple of days. All right, that is a cello. Darn it. I thought we had a winner. All right, we could do this. The other thing that we could do is we could do a search. Can look for acoustic or upright bass. Um. Pardon me? Yeah, that's that's very true. Let's look for upright bass. That's that is a better way to put it. Uh, and there's an amplifier, but and there's an Epiphone bass that is an electric bass, but upright, oh, a bib. Okay, so they don't have it. All right. Um, how long did it take for us to find that they didn't have it, minus our false alarm? Well, you know, a minute or two. All right. Because uh, remember, I'm, I'm up here talking and, and, and clicking and all that at the same time. But it really didn't take us long to find that they didn't have it. Let's look for something else. Let's look for a used laptop. All right. So, where could I find that? I could find that under, probably, for sale computers. And. Here we go. I could go about it that way. Or I could go and perform a search. And find it that way. Now notice again, we talked about there being no images on the home page. And we talked about, really, if you think about it, there's really no images we could think about that would add something to that page. But there are images on these pages, right? Because they're valuable. If I'm buying something or if I'm thinking about buying something, I certainly probably want to see a picture of it, whether it be a laptop or an upright base or something like that. So here I go and I can get a look at it and I can see this at a glance and so on. I have to say, my opinion of Craigslist changed when I did this exercise, I think, last semester. Because I was going to use Craigslist as an example of a poorly designed website. When I actually visited it, I thought, you know, it's not a, bad, not a badly designed website. It is, there is a lot of information on it, and it is a little cluttered, but it's at least organized. And it does seem to have a good search capability. So looking at it, from a purely aesthetic viewpoint, it looks ugly. It doesn't look particularly good. It looks very plain and so on. But looking at it from the perspective of a user visiting the site to serve a goal, then I would say it seems to be pretty useful for that. So remember, design is more than just the appearance. Design is identifying the goals that the users have, defining content that's going to help you satisfy those goals, deciding how to organize that content, and then you get into the, the, the design and the layout of the individual pages and the appearance of the pages. Okay, so let's continue looking at your um, project assignment. So far, um, we looked at the first two sections. Let's Let's continue from there.
All right. We talked about the strategy section. What does that consist of? Consists of a paragraph explaining what your site is about in very general terms. So a description of your site's topic or purpose. Three user personas. We talked about user personas. That's where you make a fictional person that is representative of typical users to your site. Again, I realize that everyone coming to a website is an individual, but for the size of project that we're looking at, identifying three personas seems to be a reasonable number of personas. In other words, just about whatever topic you can think of, you can think of three different groups of people that would be interested. And if you're having difficulty with that, you can talk to me and we can figure something out. For each of those three personas, think of a prioritized list of three of the goals that they're going to have. And a prioritized list of whoever's creating the site. If you're doing it for a fictional band or a real band, it would be, you know, the band would be the, the organization that's creating the site. If you're doing it for, um, you know, a, a fan site for a movie or whatever, it would be you as the creator of the site, the reason that you are uh, creating the site. So, a paragraph that summarizes your site, three personas, three goals for each personas, and three goals for the users of the site. That's what the strategy section consists of. It should be in Word. It should look professional. All right. The second section which we talked about is the requirement section or the scope section. And that's where you talk about specific pieces of content that are going to help you achieve your goals. Because just about any goal can be achieved several different ways. All right. Um, I'll think of an example. Again, I mentioned one time that I, ages ago, I worked on the K Jewelers website. Let's say one of their goals is to increase sales. There's probably a couple different ways that a jeweler with their website could increase their sales, right? One way might be to offer online sales. Let people go and purchase their goods online. All right, that might be one way to increase sales, that you can go and buy a watch or a ring or whatever online. That could satisfy the goal of increasing sales. So the goal would be to increase sales. The requirements that associate with that goal would be to allow uh, online ordering of products from the K catalog. All right. Is that the only way that they could increase their sales? Not necessarily. They could create content on their web page that increased the interest of their physical stores and drove people to their physical stores. All right. Um, now, how do you decide what you're going to do? There's two different ways that you could accomplish that goal. There's at least two. We could probably think of a lot more. All right. So. Do we allow for online sales, or do we put content on their page to sort of drive the user to visit their stores in person to purchase the goods? Well, it all depends on the user and the, and the distinct situation, uh, the unique situation. Um, it was their strategy, at least initially, I haven't visited their site in a long time, but the thought was is that a person isn't going to go and spend a lot of money on jewelry without seeing it first, right? In other words, you might buy a book off of Amazon without seeing the book first, right? But you're not going to buy a diamond ring without actually being there in person and seeing it and looking at it. So the requirements that Kay had initially on their website was not to offer online sales, but to drive people to their stores, all right? So the goal is to increase sales. The requirements to achieve those goals would be to have information on their website that would drive people to their physical stores, that would make people want to go in to where their actual stores were and see the goods and buy it. So it allowed people to shop around without leaving their living room, but the thought was is that it wasn't useful to offer online sales because no one would, would spend a lot of money on jewelry without coming in and first seeing it in person. So for, again, for every goal that you have, there are multiple ways that you could resolve that. And what you want to do is you want to pick an appropriate mix of those and decide 
what can I do without cluttering my site? All right. Um, a goal for visitors of Craigslist would be to quickly find whether or not they have the item that you're interested in buying. The requirements that Craigslist had to achieve that is number one, they had a search facility. They had, they had the ability to do a search of the site. And number two, they had a categorized listing of the, of, of the products um, on, the, on the home page so that you could quickly go to a given area. So there's two requirements that they have that would help satisfy the goal of quickly finding um, the materials. Now, there could be other things that they had as well. There could be all sorts of different things that they had, requirements that would allow people to find whether or not they had the product that they were interested in buying. But that was the two that they decided. The one thing about requirements is, again, is you don't want overkill. You don't want to have a bunch of stuff that um, is going to only clutter your website. You want to figure out a way um, that you can satisfy the goal and satisfy it well, the best way to do that without doing, um, putting a lot of content on the site that isn't needed. How do you tell that? Well, you tell that by looking at the user's perspective. You think, if I was a user, how would I look at this information? How would I go and, and, and uh, try to search through the information? All right. So what the scope section will be is, it will be simply a list of requirements. My site will have a calendar when the band is going to appear. The site will have a song that can be downloaded for the band. My site will have a two minute clip showing uh, a concert that the band performed. My site will have a merch page where people can order merch. My site will have um, brief bios of the band members and so on down the line. So it will just be a list, just you make it an unordered list if you're doing this in HTML, but a bulleted list of the items that you're going to have on your page that are going to fulfill the goals that you have for the site and that the user has for the site. When you are done, every goal should have at least one requirement that goes along with it. And every requirement should match up with at least one goal. Again, if you have a goal and there's no requirement, then there's an important need of the user that you're not addressing on your website. You need to address it. If you have a requirement that doesn't match to at least one goal, then you have stuff on your site that probably isn't needed. You're probably better off eliminating that content. So that is the scope section. For every requirement you list, have indicate what goal the requirement addresses. So in other words, what I'm thinking of is something like this. In the strategy section, I might have something like user one is a fan of the band and their goal one is to keep updated with band appearances. Goal two might be to connect with the band on social media. And goal three might be to buy merch. So in the scope section, you might have something like, you know, these are the goals. These are what the users are trying to accomplish. Goal one uh, requirement might be to have a calendar. of appearances. 
And what you should do is you should put next to this user one, goal one. Because that tells you that that sp specific requirement addresses user one's first goal. Maybe requirement two says um, have a page with links to all social media accounts. And that would address user one, goal two, and so on. Now these are all very straightforward. In some cases, a goal is going to be satisfied by several things. All right? Um, and in some cases, a given requirement might um, map to several goals. But you're going to have a list like this, this being the scope section, that being the strategy section. Your, uh, your, your requirement list should be fairly detailed and fairly comprehensive. How much is enough? All right. <laughs> Here's a few observations. First of all, ideally, let's keep in mind what you create this design document for. You create this do design document to communicate. Well, who do you need to communicate with? You need to communicate with the people that you're developing the website for, and you need to communicate with um, the people who are actually going to do the work on the site. Depending on the size of the site, all right, you may have a team of web developers. Each web developer may be responsible for a certain section of the site, or there may be different roles where one group does the, the visual appearance, one person does some of the coding behind, and so on. So it could be a mix of people working on the site. In addition, there's a person who you're building the site for. You know. um, in other words, you might be a consultant and a band hires you. Well, it's good to tell them what you're going to give them before you deliver it to the site. They look at it and they say, I hate it. Right? It's good to get your thoughts down on paper. Even if you're the only one that's developing the site, you're developing the site for your organization, and so you're the, you, you know, you're, the, you're the person that needs the site, and you're the only developer, it's good to go and document this so that you remember your thoughts, and that you get your thoughts down captured on paper. So it should be thorough enough to communicate so that everyone looking at this design document knows and gets no surprises when they look at the final site because you have laid out exactly what's going to be on that site. You've laid out a list of things that are going to be on that site so there should be no confusion about the end result. It should be thorough enough so that you could hand this over to other people and let them build the site for you. Again, at very large projects, we had people whose job it was to define the requirements and they would hand them off to a team of developers. And the developers would go and actually build the site. So this should be sort of the, you know, this is a document that tells the people that are building the site what the site should look like and, and what the content of the site should be. All right? So it needs to be thorough enough to communicate. Um, you need enough requirements. And my guess is that it will be 15 to 20 requirements. Now, this is just a number that I pulled off the top of my head, just a guess, right? based on projects I've seen in the past. If you have a project that you think is good and you can only, only come up with 12 requirements, then talk to me about it or email me, and I'll take a look at it. And maybe, yeah, maybe you can define everything that you need to do with just 12 requirements. So these numbers are not carved in stone, that there'll be 12 requirements, 15 to, to 20 requirements, rather. All right. If you have a site that has one requirement, though, gee, you probably need to work a little harder. All right. Um, so again, 15 to 20 is sort of my ballpark guess, but it could be less. And if you have less and you think you've done a thorough job covering everything your site needs, then talk to me about it. On the flip side, don't bite off more than you can chew. I've had some students that were very ambitious and developed specifications for websites that were far bigger than they needed to be for the purpose of this class. So it's summertime, right? You should be out having fun, you know, besides uh, doing uh, schoolwork. So don't, 
divide, define a project that's going to have 100 requirements or even 50 requirements. All right. If you are at that point where you have a lot of stuff, then maybe consider scaling down your project. Sort of like what I said before, if you were going to do a site about sports, uh, maybe you need to narrow that down. Pick a specific sport or pick a specific city sports teams or something like that. All right. So almost any topic you can either make broader or make narrower to sort of fit in the constraints for this class. You should document if you change the requirements. It's OK to change the requirements. That's definitely a real world thing, you know? Because as much as we try to plan and decide what we're going to do in advance, things change. We realize that we forgot something important. Or the client realizes that we forgot something important. And that doesn't mean say, well, no, that's what we said in the requirements. That's what we're going to do. If an oversight is noticed, then you've got to go back and correct that oversight. But you should document it. Now, after you've turned in the requirements in and, and, and this document, if you totally decide to change your project completely, then you should, you should talk to me. There's no need to define as a requirement the basics of good web design, easy navigation, etc. And those should neither be requirements nor goals. All right? Finally, these, these, these guidelines are very subjective. Please feel free to send me a draft to review. All right. So what do we have when we're done with the scope section? We have, uh, we have goals. We have requirements. The next section is the structure section. And that is where we start organizing our content into pages. All right. That's where we start deciding what is going to be on, on each page. And again, you don't want too much or too little on any given pages. Now, any topic that you think about can be organized any number of different ways. All right? It's up to you to decide what's the best way to divide up your topic and to organize your, your topic. All right. For example, let's say we have a sporting goods store. Sporting goods store sells sports products. What are some different ways that we could organize the content, the products, in a sporting goods store? What are some different ways that we could uh, organize the content in a sporting goods store? By sport. Okay. So we could organize by sport. So we might have our home page. Then we might have baseball, softball, tennis, basketball. and so on. What's another way we could organize the same content? Go ahead. Uh, by, uh, yeah, by gender. We could have a home page and we could have, first of all, we could have adults and kids, then we could have men, women, boy, girl, or maybe we have, maybe we don't have the layer for adults and kids, maybe we just have men women, girl, boy. So maybe we do that. All right? Those are two different ways that we could organize the same content. 
right? I'm sure we could think about other ways, right? We could split up our site and have equipment apparel, like clothes, and maybe shoes. So, you know, tennis racket, baseball bats, exercise bike is in here, sweatpants, shirts, socks are here, shoes are here. And then each one of these we could categorize further. All right. We could categorize by brand. We could have Nike, a section for Nike, a section for Reebok, a section for Adidas, and so on. The point is, is it doesn't take much to think of several ways that we could divide our content and split it up into individual pages. All right? But we have to decide on one, right? Or maybe a couple of them, because it is possible to categorize things in different ways on a website. So maybe we think of one or, or maybe two. For this project, one ought to be sufficient. How are we going to decide what the right way is? the right way to organize our content is. Are we going to look at it from our perspective? We're going to look at it from the perspective of the users, of the personas. In other words, how are they likely to visualize how our content should be organized? Now, in large sites, when you develop large sites, they do uh, usability studies where they set up different navigation schemes and they bring in sample users and they ask users, gee, if you wanted to find information about buying a tennis racket, how would you find it? And they see what the user tries and they see if they're successful or not. Um, I did uh, a few, well, I, I'm saying a few summers, it was like 15 summers ago, I did uh, a fellowship, a summer fellowship at NASA and I talked, uh, I saw what they did with their internal website uh, for their employees. You know, the government loves forms, right? There's like a million forms for everything in the government. And one of the biggest problems that um, the employees of, of NASA had is finding the correct form. So if I'm going out of town for work and I want to submit an expense form, how do I find that? If I want to request a sick day or vacation day, how do I find that? If I want mileage reimbursement because I drove to a, a meeting, how do I request that? They have all these different forms. And what they did is they actually set up a couple of alternative navigations. And they asked, they brought in some employees, which, you know, they had right there. And they said, okay, let's say you plan on going on vacation in, in a couple months. Let's see how you'd find the form. And they would observe what the user did and were they, were they able to find the form or not. If they were able to find the form easily, they knew that that particular navigation or that particular structure was good. If they tried a certain path and they weren't able to find it and they had to go back to the beginning and try again or try again, then they knew that that wasn't a good one. So they were able to actually observe users <coughs> and identify if it worked for them. Now, that's again, that's a government agency working on a very big site that many, many users are going to have, and you had the users right there. You're not able to do that for every site. Sometimes you do have a focus group where you bring in some of your users. You know, you could advertise for it, and you could test out the site that way, and do what's called a usability study. But the bottom line is, is you can do that on big projects. If you don't have the resources to do that, what you have to do is you have to see through the eyes of the people that you're developing the site for. That's why the personas are useful. That's a tool to help you visualize, gee, how am I going to view this site? I talked about the example last time of the way LC categorized their information technology. Um, how the degree programs used to be set up by division. And the problem with that is, if we looked at it from the perspective of a high school kid, how, what does a high school kid know about how Learning Community College is divided up into divisions? They don't know. They don't know, if it, you know where computers belongs. They don't know. They might think that it belongs in engineering or business or whatever. Well, by 
organizing the site instead of by our internal divisions, but how the outside world sees sort of the career opportunities, then that made it much easier and better for our prospective users, our personas, to find that information. Again, everything that you're going to do, including dividing the, page, uh, the, the site into pages, is viewed through the filter of how these personas see the information and how they see the site. So, the structure section consists of a structure diagram. And a structure diagram is, again, something like this, something I drew. You're going to have a home page. And if you're doing the band's website, maybe you will have our calendar. Maybe we'll have audio samples. Maybe we'll have a merch page. You know, maybe something like that, maybe a few other pages. So I want you to create a, a drawing like that. All right. And you can use Word. You can use really any tool that you want to to draw it. Uh, you can even draw it on paper and scan it in or take a photo and incorporate it into a Word document. I'm not picky about the way that it looks. All right. I do want you to, uh, to uh, send it in a standard format. So send it as a Word document or a PDF. Don't send it as a Visio file, for example. If you develop it in Visio, which is a tool that you can use for drawing, then export it to a PDF or a Word document. Yes? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Just something that's standard, something that I don't have to have specific software uh, to uh, install to view it. Then I want you to describe why you picked that. All right? Because, um, again, as I said, any kind of uh, content could be divided a bunch of different ways. I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say I was going to do a website on the history of rock music. All right? There's at least the, a couple ways that I could divide up that content. I could have my home page. I could have a pre-rock page, let's say pre-1950. Then I could have pages for each decade. 50s, 60s, 70s, and well nothing good happened after the 70s so I can cut it off there. I'm just kidding. Well then I'd have 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s, 2010s. That's one way I could divide this content, right? and I could put it on its side. Or flip it upside down. There we go. That's one way I could do it. Another way I could do it would be home page, singers, guitarists, bass players, drummers. I don't know, just pick that off the top of my head. Now, which way would I pick? I don't know. I'd have to look at the, the users. But I might look and say, well, the intent of the site is a history. And history, when you think of history, usually you think of it as happening chronologically. So because of that, I would think that my users would expect to see it chronologically. All right? That in my, in my users whose goals are to understand the history, to understand how one style of music evolved into another, to see it displayed chronologically would help them make more sense of that. So therefore, I pick this method. So what I would turn in then for this section would be 
this diagram saying I decided to divide it up in the decades and you know show the drawing I'd say I decide I, I considered doing it by the the, uh, the the instrument that the musician played and singers guitarists and so on but I decided that users looking for history would want to see the material presented in a chronological way so just a little paragraph explaining why I picked that particular organization and what other organizations you considered other than the one that you picked. All right. Next. So this is still in your Word document. So your Word document has three sections so far and it's going to get a fourth and a second. All right. The fourth section is the skeleton or wireframes. And wireframes are simply like block diagrams that show the main sections of your page. So maybe this is my banner. Maybe this is my navigation. Maybe this is my content area, and this is my footer. That's all a wireframe is, basically. Now you could get a little fancier. You could show that the banner is going to have the logo and the site name and description and so on. You could say there might be a main content area and there might be an aside over here of related materials or something like that. But essentially it's just a block diagram showing the main sections of your page. Now, do you have to, how many wireframes are you going to have for your site? Well, for a site this size I would suggest most of you will get by with just one wireframe. That's great, right? Less work. All right. You don't necessarily only need one wireframe. You could have a couple of wireframes if you had pages that uh, were different than your main pages. For example, if I had a photo gallery page, my photo gallery page might look a little different than my um, my main pages. Let's say most of my pages look like this. My photo gallery page might look like this. Thumbnails are simply small pictures that you can click on. So maybe my gallery page will look like this where the rest of my pages look like this. Or maybe my home page looks a certain way and the rest of my pages look different. So for the most part I would say you're going to have one or two wireframes. One might be all you need. You might need only one wireframe to to do everything that you need. Or maybe you're going to have one page or a couple pages that are a little bit different, in which case you have two wireframes. If you want, if you start thinking about three or four wireframes, then talk to me because maybe there's something that, that we need to discuss. Um, again, um, you want your pages to look consistent. So you want your pages, for the most part, to have the same layout. That's very reassuring for the users to know that everything is in the same place on every page and they don't have to go searching around for stuff. So you want there to be consistency and you want your pages to look very similar. All right? But there are reasons uh, just because they're supposed to be uh, consistent and similar doesn't mean they need to look identical. Therefore, um, there can be a little bit of variation per uh, um, between a couple different pages. 
So your wireframe will simply be drawings like that that you include in your document. So your document, your Word document or your PDF or, or whatever will contain the strategy, which is goals, personas, a summary of the site, requirements, which is a list of the stuff that you're going to have on the site, structure, which is a structure diagram and an explanation of why you chose that structure, and then finally one or two wireframes that show how your pages are going to be laid out. All right. Now we're on to the prototype. Here's where it's going to actually be HTML and CSS coding. All right. What does the word prototype mean? When I use the word prototype, what does that mean? What is a prototype? This is, this is a point of the class where I wish I was a ventriloquist. I could throw my voice to pretend it was someone out in the audience uh, saying that. A prototype, if you think of, is like a working model. All right? In other words, it doesn't have to do everything that your finished website's going to do. But it should be enough to show people how your website's going to look and how it's going to act. So, you might not have the fonts exactly the way you want them to. You might not have all the images that you want to use or you might not have all the content uh, that you want or, or whatever. And you, Maybe you're still tweaking the layout a little bit where it's not exactly right. But think of it like a rough draft. All right? So, how finished does it need to be? It should be finished enough so people can get a good idea of what your site is going to look like. By the same token, you don't want to make your prototype perfect. Why not? Because if someone comes along, if the person you're developing the site for looks at it and says, hey, that's a horrible design. I don't want it like that. You don't want to have wasted a lot of your time making it perfect when your user doesn't like the prototype you developed and sends you back to the drawing board. So remember what it is. All these words that we're putting in the document are important, but a lot of times, people don't really know what they think of a website until they actually see it up on their screen and working like a website. Therefore, the prototype, which is actual HTML and CSS pages, um, are going to uh, be important because that's what the user is going to see and that's what a user might be able to comment on. Now, when we talk about building a prototype, typically there is a couple steps involved. We're going to start out with a wireframe. So I'm going to start out with this wireframe. I'll start out with this wireframe. And I'm going to build a template. What do I mean by a template? I mean a template I mean is a it is a web page that I can take and copy to all of my other web pages. So, if I was doing the history of rock and roll, let's say and this is a structure diagram I have. I would need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 20, 2010s. I would need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 pages. Well, I'm not going to build 9 pages from scratch. All right? Because all of them fit this wireframe. They all have the same basic layout. So it's not like I have to build nine pages from scratch. I'm going to build a template that's going to have all the stuff that all the pages have in common. So this is going to be in common. This is going to be in common. This is going to be in common. When I say in common, I mean this is going to be on every single page. All right, every single page. 
So I'm going to build a template, kind of like a form letter. Let's say you had a, a letter that you're going to send, uh, a cover letter for your resume. You don't write that cover letter for every single place that you visit, that you apply. You have a generic one, and then you fill in the name of the person and the address and so on and mail it out. So just like with this, you're going to build a template for your web page, and then you're going to clone that web page, and you're going to change the content. So I'm going to create this page. Then I'm going to clone it for the home page. I'm going to clone it for the pre-1950 page. I'm going to clone it for the 50s page. I'm going to clone it for the 60s page, and so on. So making a website with nine pages isn't nine times as time-consuming as making a uh, one web page, because you make the one web page and then you clone it. So what we're going to do over the next class or so is we're going to make a template, and we're going to clone it. All right, we're going to make a template for this wireframe, and then we're going to clone it. And we're going to make a few pages of our prototype. So we're going to go, we're going to take this wireframe and make a prototype from it. All right? So let's go and start baking the web page. At a glance, what I see at least four tags on this page. Header, nav, section, and footer. All right? So just by sketching it out, I know sort of the basic shell of what the page is going to look like. The header, the nav, and the footer are going to be the same on every page. The only thing that's going to be different is going to be the section and the, the specific content section. That's going to have different stuff on each page. So let's go and let's start with our template. So I'm going to put in the basic tags and declarations. And simultaneously, I'm going to be developing the HTML document and the CSS document. I'm going to start by developing the HTML document. Those two go hand in hand, right? I'm going to first develop the HTML document, then I'm going to style it so that my page fits that wireframe. So I have my header. which is, I'm going to make an H1, history of rock and roll. Yeah. And again, I could put more stuff in here. For now, we'll just keep it simple and we'll, we'll do this. I'm going to have my nav. We'll come to, back to that one in a second here. We have a section that's going to be different on each page. And then we're going to have a footer.
Remember, things that start with the ampersand are those special codes. This is a copyright symbol. Then I have a link with a email address to email to. Now let's go in and fill these other things in. The section. Section is the one spot of the page that is going to be different for every page. All right. The other three areas are going to be the same, and I'm I'm, I'm going to clone them. The section that was going to be different on the, the page about the 50s is going to have stuff about the 50s and 60s is going to have stuff about the 60s and so on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to put some placeholder text. And in the world of, of graphical design for ages, they've used a, a kind of fake text called Greek text. And Greek text is sort of like fake Latin. And you can sort of put that in there as a placeholder. Should you do this on a final web page? Of course not, all right? Because it's gibberish, it doesn't make sense. But when you're just designing it and you just want to get an idea of how the page is going to look with some text in there, but you don't necessarily know what the final text is going to be, it's appropriate to put Greek text in. Look at it this way. Again, on a big project, there could be a bunch of people working on it. Uh, I might be the web designer, but there may be someone else that's actually writing the content for it. Maybe a, a music professor somewhere is writing the actual material that's going to be there. All right. If you Google Greek text, you can actually Generate a paragraph. And here's a paragraph in Greek text. I'm just going to copy it and paste it. Does this mean anything? I don't know. I actually don't think it's Greek. I think it looks more like Latin to me, but what do I know? All right, so I'm going to put that in here, and I'm not going to worry about it. Now, the navigation, on the other hand, I want to make sure I get this correct, right? The sections that are common to all my pages, I want to make sure I get perfect. Why? Because the next step in this process is I'm going to make copies of this page. I'm going to make, I think, what do we say, 10 copies of this page? One for the home page, one for the pre-1950, one for the 50s, one for the 60s, one for the 70s, and so on. And all this content is in common on all those, all those pages. So I want to make sure I get it right because if I go and make a copy of it and then I decide, well, wait a minute, I want something else in there, then I have to go back and change all the copies. So I want to make sure when I'm developing the template that everything that all the pages have in common, I get perfect. All right? So I'm going to spend some time making sure that this is correct before I go ahead to the next step. Now, navigation is what? It's an unordered list. Remember, in HTML, we're, de we're defining what the content is, all right? not how it's going to look. So I'm going to have a series of links. By default, it's pretty good practice to call your home page index.html. And I'm going to make copies for pre-1950, whoops.
think that's all. And at this point, I'm going to decide what the pages are named so I know what to call them when I copy them. Now remember, so far, we're working on the content that is the same on all the pages. Consistency is a good design principle, right? We want our pages to look very similar. That makes it easier for the user to use them. They don't have to guess what things are. So I'm going to go and save this on the desktop. And I'm going to call it template.html. And I'll save it. And now when I look at it, I have this. Very bare bones right? Which I can expect because I've not put any style on it at all. All right. Does this look like our wireframe? Not really. Not really. Okay. Because it looks like our navigation ought to be oriented horizontally. But our navigation is oriented vertically. It also looks like there's borders around these things and that these don't take up the whole page, that there's a little bit of gap here. However, it does have the content that we want on our page. It has our banner. And we're going to assume that banner is fine for now. It has navigation links. It has a content section, and it has a footer. So it has all the content that it needs for the pages, for, for, for all the common stuff that's going to be on all the pages. It just doesn't look right. Well, here's where we get into CSS. So we've defined the content. Content equals HTML. CSS equals the appearance and the layout. Now. We're going to go over something called the CSS box model now. And this is a real important concept. Essentially, every block tag on our page, and what's a block tag? Well, the ones that stack on top of each other. So the header, the nav, the section, the footer, they're all block tags. There are certain characteristics and certain things that we have in common that we can go and we can put style on. So let's go and create my external style sheet file. I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to save it as main CSS. And we're going to put a link to it in this page. And it, uh, uh, correct, it is in the head section.
a type equals text slash CSS, rel equals style sheet, those always stay the same for our main style sheet, and then finally href equals, and then we have the name of our style sheet. So I'm going to go here, and one of the things that we can put on a block, on a box in CSS, is a border. All right? So let's start by putting a border around our nav, our, um, our, nav, our, our uh, header, our section, and our footer. So I'm going to say header. Border style, solid. Border width, 5px. Border color, black. Okay, and I'm going to re. Okay, so when I do that and view it, I have a border around that. Now, for certain CSS properties, there's a shorthand you can use. Notice how each of these properties start with border dash style, border dash, dash width, and so on. I can specify those properties individually, or I can uh, specify them together. This is the same thing. It's just using a little bit different syntax. Border 5px black solid. That's a shorthand, and that says the exact same thing as this does. So we have a border on the header and a border on the nav. How does this work? Well, 5px has to be talking about the border width, right? 5px couldn't possibly be the border color. 5px isn't a valid value for a color. So the browser's smart enough to know if I see px there, uh, which stands for pixels, that I'm talking about the width of it. It's smart enough to know that black relates to a color. So black isn't the style, or black isn't the width. Black is the color. And finally, solid is one of the border styles that you have. Now, if you want to see what other things are available, <coughs> you can Google CSS border style, and you can see all of what you have available. dotted, double, and so on. Groove. Let's use groove. doesn't work. Oh well, we'll undo it. Okay, back to solid. The reason I show you these two different ways is sometimes if you're reading in a book or online, they'll show one way, sometimes they'll show another way. You can, even if you want, take it to the next level and specify a different border for the top than on the bottom. All right? So you can specify a border, uh, a red border on the top, a green border on the bottom if you wanted to. All right? We won't do an example of that right now, but later on I think we will. Right now we're just going to do borders. 
Borders are one of the things that you can add to a box. So let me finish adding them to the other two boxes. And there we have a border going around everything. So we're starting to look more like our wireframe here. Yes. All right. A couple things, though, if we look in the wireframe. There's sort of a space here. From the edge of the screen to where the border starts. Now here there's a little tiny space. But well, we might want that space to be bigger. And notice also in the wireframe that this doesn't go the entire width of the screen. It only goes part of the width. So another thing that we can specify, there's two other properties that we can specify with the, with the, in the box model for these block tags, is we can specify a width and we can specify a margin. So let's do the width first. And I can specify the width in pixels. What's a pixel? It's a dot, individual dot on the screen. So if you look real, real close at, at, at our screen, you actually have a series of little dots. And in this monitor, there's approximately 1,000 or 1,200 or something like that dots. So 600 pixels would be maybe right around half the, half the width of the screen. So I'm going to put that width on every thing. And if I do that, notice now it doesn't go all the way across. It only goes part of the way across. But notice that it is sort of smashed to the one side. It's sort of shoved over to um, that side. That will be the margin, which we'll address in a second here. All right. Now, I can specify the width two ways. One way is through a certain number of pixels. And if I specify it a number of pixels, it doesn't matter how big the screen is, it's going to stay that width. And if I make the screen smaller, I'm going to get a scroll bar. I can also specify a percentage. So I could say the width of 60%. And if I make it 60%, the width of this is going to change depending on how big I make the screen. So if I make the screen narrow, that's 60% of that. If I make the screen wider, it's 60% of that. Does anyone have a, a thought on whether you're more likely to use pixels or percentages? What do you think is probably better to use most of the time? Pixels or percentages? Percentages. Percentages. Why do you say that? Uh, because everybody has a different size screen. Because everyone has a different size screen. All right. Um, in other words, if someone has just a gigantic monitor, that'll take up 60% of that. If you kept it at pixels on a giant monitor, the web page would be tiny in the corner. It would look like a postage stamp. All right. Someone has a smaller monitor, 60% will be 60% of that. Now this has especially has implications when we start talking about mobile devices. All right. Because with mobile devices you have all different kinds of screen widths. And therefore you want your page to be flexible to look good in a variety of different screen sizes. And percentages is the first step to do that. Now notice as you make this real, real, real small, 
that it still fits, but you might not want it to get smaller than a certain size, in which case you can also supply a minimum width. So I could put in a minimum width, let's say, of 300 pixels. And those two things will make it, will work hand in hand. In other words, they'll make it 60% of the screen unless the screen is smaller than, or unless that becomes less than 300 and won't, won't make it any smaller. So it's making it smaller, it's making it smaller, it's making it smaller. At a certain point, did I forget to say this? At a certain point, it won't get any smaller. So it gets smaller to a point, and then it won't get any smaller than that. So when we start looking at doing development for mobile devices, oftentimes a combination of a percentage for width and then a minimum width um, is exactly what, what it takes. Now, we still haven't moved it over, though. It's still on the side, right out along the side. We can move it over by using the margin. And I'm going to start out by putting the margin of this of, let's say, 100 pixels. I'm going to copy and paste that for everyone. All right. Whoa, interesting. What did it do? The margin works in four directions, right? Margin is the space between blocks. So there's actually four different margins. There's a top margin, a right margin, a bottom margin, and a left margin. All right. So this put a margin to the left, a margin to the right, but it also put a margin in between them. So I could change this by saying margin dash left. And it would only do the left margin. All right, and now it's pushed over. And gee, that looks pretty well centered, right? Unless I go and make it bigger. Then it's no longer centered. Close to centered, but not exactly. If I want to make it centered, what I can do is this. I can say, Margin, zero pixel auto. Uh, yeah. I'll show you what this does and then we'll talk about it. Now as I make it smaller, it keeps it in the center up to the point where it's not getting any smaller. All right. What does margin zero pixels auto mean? Well, as we said, there's four margins. Top, 
right, bottom, and left. And that's the way to think about them. Think of them about them going clockwise, starting at the top. Top, right, bottom, left. When I have one value for the margin, it gives it for all four values. So if I put in a margin of 100 pixels, let's do that here. That puts the margin in all four directions being 100 pixels. So if I only specify one value, it repeats that value for the top, for the right, for the bottom, and for the left. What if I give two values? So if I give zero pixels and auto, then the top gets zero pixels, the right gets auto, and then it repeats again. The bottom gets zero pixels, and the left gets auto. Auto means to simply center it between the two sides. So, if I say margin, zero pixels auto, then the top has zero pixels. The right is automatically set the margin, which means it's centering it. The bottom has zero pixels, and the left is auto. So to center something on a page or within the area, you say margin zero pixels auto. And again, there's four directions for the margin, top, right, bottom, left, and since there's only two values, those repeat again. These two things are equivalent. If I were to say zero pixels auto or zero pixels auto, zero pixels auto, right? Because in both cases, this is the top and the bottom, this is the right and the left, or top, right, bottom, left. All right. There's one more thing that I want to talk about today, uh, and then we'll continue this next time. And that is, notice how this text goes right up to the edge of it. That sort of looks sloppy. All right? What I can do is I can put in a padding. And padding is the distance from the border to where the text starts. So I could say padding 10 pixels. And notice what it did, it put a little bit of space between the edge and there. Now notice there's a few things on this page that we didn't control via our CSS, like this little gap up here, this gap going vertically, um, the fact that the links are blue. But again, browser's default mixed with your CSS code. So. What did we cover as far as the box mod model goes today? Border, width, margin, and padding. I think that's everything. Border, width, margin, and padding. All right, those are the four basic things, and we'll review this in more detail. Now, notice how we're getting a lot closer to our wireframe that we decided. There is one problem, though. Notice these links are oriented vertically. We want these links to be uh, oriented horizontally. Yeah. How can we fix that? That's the cliffhanger, right? I'm not going to tell you that. You can try to figure it out for next time, and we'll begin the class next time. You know, they, they do that with movies, right? You know, every movie, like at the end of the movie, there's a way for the bad guy to sort of escape so that they can have a sequel for the next movie, you know. Um, and that's the same thing I'm doing here. Uh, I'm leaving this so that you'll be in suspense between now and Thursday. 
If you're that curious, you can go online and you can figure it out, or we'll talk about that on Thursday. Now, once we start doing this, again, you'll notice over the next few classes, we're gonna, this still looks kind of like a basic page, but it's a lot better organized than the very initial page without any CSS goes. We're gonna start exerting more and more and more control over the layout of the page over the next several classes by using stuff associated with the box model. Any questions here? All right, we'll see you over in lab.